Because I'm studying the limbic system, the amygdala and all these emotion related areas, uh, it was a, a natural outgrowth of that to start talking about disorders uh, in these models. So it's not just about successful filtering, uh, but also, well, what, how, what can go wrong? There's many ways that things that could, get, can go wrong. And that allows us to not just ask what are the correlates, like which area is involved, but why? So, so, for, so in the case of schizophrenia, it's again this uh, circuit involving the TRN, this thin layer of inhib inhibitory neurons and the thalamus and the cortex. So we were just focusing on what else we could say about this three area uh, circuit. It's a, it's a generic circuit, so for different systems, uh, you have the same kind of motif, we call it a circuit motif. And so um, uh, schizophrenia is a very complicated disorder and no one has really found a definitive cause or even a definitive correlate. But in recent years, one line of uh, research experimentalists have uncovered is I dysfunctional inhibition. So there's local inhibition in the cortex and tamping things down. Then there's the TRN itself, which has been linked with uh, schizophrenia. So, so we thought, let's look at this circuit and see what it can do and what can go wrong. So when you're making a computational model, you need to pick a behavior that is tractable. Like modeling hallucinations would be cool, but it's very difficult because you know, we really don't understand how language is generated. So getting to that is, is too complicated. So what we found, I, I was quite intrigued to learn that a few years ago that uh, one of the most uh, um, readily identifiable symptoms of schizophrenia is uh, disordered eye movements. So schizophrenia patients and sometimes their close relatives have uh, an inability to fix their eyes on a target uh, and for instance you could have a, uh, a dot on a screen that's moving around and, and uh, healthy controls they can follow along that dot just fine like going in a figure of eight for instance. Um, whereas with a, a schizophrenia patient, their, their eyes will often be quite erratic. And there was a paper showing that mm. a machine learning method involving a couple of eye movement uh, tasks, just using those, could tell um, schizophrenia patients and their close relatives from controls with something like above 95% accuracy. Wow. So it's a diagnostic symptom, uh, a very useful for you know, at-risk uh, populations and for the patients themselves. Um, wow. and so the question is, well, what's producing this, uh, this symptom? Yeah. And m might that shed light on other symptoms? Yeah. So I set up a circuit involving a simplified version of the, the three brain regions, cortex, TRN, thalamus. And I made a simple eye tracking uh, um, model that, that uses the, this kind of circuit to uh, maintain a, a, a target at the center of attention. Um, and what we saw is that these uh, disrupting a couple of different classes of inhibition could produce this erratic behavior. And so, so, so that's something that experimentalists can now maybe work with. We showed that different inter, uh, disruptions could look vaguely similar, but also have differences. So this ties into the idea that schizophrenia and potentially other disorders may not just be one disorder. They may be a family of disorders with different causes that seem outwardly similar. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very important going forward for the field. And I think the field is more and more acknowledging this. So apart from that diversity of causes story, one idea that we elaborate in the discussion section is, is the idea that um, going off track uh, is uh, maybe a feature of other symptoms of schizophrenia. So one symptom uh, is having disordered thoughts. So it may be that uh, if you can't track uh, a dot, some, if that similar disruption is going on elsewhere, it's, you're not able to follow a th uh, the context relevant set of thoughts. So the same disruption going on in an analogous circuit might prevent uh, uh, someone from holding on to a th the line of thinking and sort of jumping from one thing to the other. So it's an interesting way of uh, looking at how a simple local circuit disruption can have these uh, widespread effects uh, in different systems. Okay, this example was, uh, now I'm thinking my imagination's roaring about all these other potential diagnostic methods mm -hmm. that don't yet exist that, mm -hmm. we're, that we're gonna be able to figure out and leverage 
machine learning to be able to more effectively um, figure it out. Right, right, um, yeah. And then also when you're when you're explaining um, this potential um, that uh, that s s something as complex as a, as a schizophrenia could potentially be a myriad of different um, involvement um, in different brain regions. This is exactly, yeah. a very complicated, um, <clears throat> and this is all the way to when a humans even in the womb and then they're born and like there's you know foundational infrastructures that get laid out at, during that time period and how that interplays with their adolescent and adult life exactly. then yeah. um, okay I have I have a I have a question pre as we get into um, depression I want to ask about um, schizophrenia um, I've had several conversations um, with people about how um, we may all be uh, the spectrum of schizophrenia, potentially, mm -hmm. uh, from a good schizophrenia to a bad, potentially, schizophrenia, and okay. how um, uh, in, at, in, in, in what, what we've created with hyper-realities, where, um, it, like, a Santa Claus is kind of like a hyper-reality. We've made up a story, okay. and, we, and we call it real, mm -hmm. and then pe we tell some people tell their kids that that's real yeah. and there's cookies and stuff and, mm -hmm. and sliding down the chimney with presents and mm -hmm, all this mm -hmm, kind of stuff, mm -hmm. reindeer, etc. cetera. And, um, <clears throat> and then it almost gets, you know, in a sense, there's this, these two competing realities right. that are then occurring. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, for, f and, and some people even say um, one of the most um, uh, potentially, uh, one of the greatest measurements of, of intelligence is one's ability to abstractly reason multiple perspectives, mm -hmm. multiple variables on a, on a given issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, when you're doing that, what you're doing is you're trying to see how like a low socioeconomic status person sees the world, how a rich person sees the world, how someone from India, how someone from Pakistan, how someone from um, different countries, also different genders, different religions, how people see the world, right? So if you're trying to balance all these perspectives and see them all. So do you see kind of where I'm coming that um, in this term? And how do you feel about all of that? So I just started reading uh, a book sort of from left field compared to the neuroscience st side. It's called The Sublime Object of Psychiatry. It's a kind of a more a humanities approach to schizophrenia. So it describes schizophrenia as a sublime object. And what they mean by that is it schizophrenia has been defined by various fields, including biological psychiatry, and psychoanalysis as sort of beyond understanding, uh, meaning that you could maybe study it, but you could never <laughs> empathize with, with a schizo <laughs> schizophrenia patient. Which it's, an it's a very strange book, but very interesting, because uh, I have, and you know, people can relate to this. They're like, yeah, the when the schizophrenia patient is describing their hallucinations or their overarching world theory, you can kind of make sense of parts of it, but the whole thing, you just, it's very hard to understand what's going on with that person. So. Um, if, what, if I understand what you're saying correctly, perhaps some of these people are kind of torn between so many perspectives yeah. that uh, they, they um, end up with this mosaic idea that, yeah, that yeah. is a, pr a product of perspectives that don't even sit well together. It, it, it's a fun speculation, yeah. but you know, when you're yeah. talking about disorders, that you have to remember there's a lot of suffering involved in this, yes, and, yes. There and is. so yes, you wouldn't, you wouldn't is. wish this on anyone, uh, <laughs> yeah. and especially the psychosis side of things and, and yeah. catatonia. You know. And then there's also a way to, um, to um, as one potentially experiences a psychosis from this mosaic of worldviews, let's mm -hmm, say, mm -hmm. uh, there is a way to. Um, live with that in a gentle way, in a way that um, creates almost a deeper degree of empathy for, for different worldviews in that sense. And so, although it can at times feel like it's a big uh, uh, taking on the burden uh, to be able to relate to all of these different worldviews, at the same time, it, it makes one super well-rounded and in that sense. But um, so it's a good, I, I, another way to view this is just the way that we use um, the social media culture. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Because when you take a look at people's profiles, it's, um, it's, it's only almost exclusively their best selves. Sure, that's interesting, and, yeah. And so then that becomes, you know, what's real in this <laughs> sense? What is actually you? 
because is you really only your photos of you looking your absolute best, traveling, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. having the best meals, the best people? Is it real? No. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> because you're definitely not po posting when you feel anxiety or when you feel depressed or when you, um, you know, you're feeling a lack of love or, um, you know. So, so here's again this, this, this idea of what is reality mm -hmm. and how can um, how do hyper realities how do um, um, uh, balancing different worldviews into a large mosaic how do these things relate to schizophrenia it's a fascinating question if we're in a simulation or not you know, that's <laughs> well, where we, yeah, yeah, yeah. These, these are all hard, very very hard questions but what you said about empathy I think can okay, help please, maybe yes. ground this in something so I read a few years ago a fascinating paper on schizophrenia in different cultures. So it, I, I believe it was called Hearing Voices in, uh, I think Africa, or in Ghana and China. Like there was an African city and an Indian city. <coughs> Excuse me. And the, uh, it w I discovered it through a blog called Neuroanthropology, mm. which, uh, so the point of the paper was that uh, it's widely uh, believed that schizophrenia is a fairly universal disorder affecting around 1% of people worldwide, but the specific manifestations of it can be quite different. So, meaning the content of the hallucinations is different. <coughs> so, um, in different parts of the world, like for instance, apparently in the West and in America, a lot of the uh, voices uh, are uh, potentially giving sort of violent instructions of some sort. Whereas apparently in India, some the voices sometimes are a motherly voice telling you to clean up your room. <laughs> so, so there's that difference. Then there's also the, the way in which society responds to the person having hallucinations. So the paper talked about how in certain tribes, they frame this having of hallucinatory voices in terms of possession. So a spirit is possessing you. And interestingly, uh, you might think, well, that's unscientific, it's nonsense. But it, this may actually help reintegrate people into society because uh, when the person is not hearing voices or acting weird uh, their belief is well they can come join work because the spirit isn't with them today and allowing people to be in society and be a productive member of society is really important and one of the things you you read for instance in that book I mentioned earlier uh, is that schizophrenia is sometimes defined in terms of inability to contribute to uh, useful work so there's a capitalist element to mm -hmm. who we decide is like incapable of being useful so the way that society and responds in what sense because if you give them a big uh, paint uh, kit or, yeah yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Who well knows? you know I, I often wonder if you know in, in earlier and this is a popular idea that in earlier generations people who were prophets or maybe shaman might have been what we would now call schizophrenia uh, patients so um, so how the culture responds uh, is important and also how they tell people so for a long time in America there was an instruction to patients to ignore the hallucinations whereas what you said about empathy is very relevant because some places they instruct uh, patient, patients to listen to their not act on everything that the voice tells them to do if but they're telling them to do things yeah. but you could in the spirit of empathy towards people outside these constructed people that yeah. may exist in you are in a sense um, perspectives they might not be correct or accurate, yes, correct. but as with most people, people just want to be heard yeah. and, and given some kind of consideration. You don't have to list, act on every piece of advice you receive, but yeah. giving them the, the time to be heard yeah. is a great way to diffuse frustration and tension rather than ignoring people. Yes. So, um, so, so empathy towards oneself may be important too, yeah. or, or, or one's selves. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is this has been such a fascinating back and forth on on schizophrenia, and I really am so interested in it.